In the spirit of reconciliation, Yellow Ladybugs acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to their elders past and present and extend their respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. I'm Professor of Autism Research at University College London in the UK. Yeah, I mean, you know, as you well know, access to healthcare can be really challenging for autistic people at the best of times. Um, There are all kinds of barriers which prevent them from having the very best care, you know, from, you know, dealing with the booking systems or the receptionist, um, um, dealing with various procedures like that that are ill suited to their needs, or being with clinicians um, and other healthcare professionals that don't understand what it's like to be autistic, um, and you know what and what that what that might mean um, in terms of giving them the best care. So my name is Chennai Shihair, um, and I am one of the co-directors of Rainbow Muse Clinic. Um, and we do lots of different kinds of therapy, like uh, psychology, art therapy, play therapy. Well, I know initially, even when it came to booking um, the different shots and things, um, I would do it with um, people on Zoom. Um, so we'd do it together. We would find out where people had had good experiences. Um, So as soon as someone said, I went to such and such a place, we would say we'd rather wait to get in where we know someone had a good experience than wing it um, because like the potential trauma of the unknown versus knowing it's it's an extra week, but they're kind and patient or that kind of thing. Um, When kids initially, we were just focusing on adults when, um, it became kids as well. Um, in the clinic through play therapy, we practiced. We have doctor kids. We spent weeks and weeks getting fake abs and band aids and and uh, role playing. Um, and then as well, knew some of the centers where there were shorter wait times. Um, getting a sense of the environments at different places. So like if you're going to, um, some people were fortunate enough that they could go to their regular GP uh, and now you can more and more, you can go to your regular GP, but more initially when they were scarce, it was it was every man for himself kind of um, times. Um, I know when I went for my shots, I, I did a little bit of sussing out myself. Um, and then I was able to kind of build. And once I felt like I'd had a positive experience in that space and it, it wasn't perfect, um, at that stage, it wasn't in my regular GP. Um, I knew what I was kind of looking out for. I could make like mini social stories, like you will arrive. There will be a huge amount of people. You are going to sit in a room and it's going to be like this, but sometimes, knowing what's going to happen and being able to fully prepare people. Um, The room will be this color with this kind of lighting and then this will happen. And then it is going to be a large volume of people, a large volume of strangers in close proximity, even though it's the scary thing for this amount of time. Um, It can help. Some places are more clued in than others. So calling ahead and prepping staff you can call ahead and prep reception staff and say um so and so is going to come and they're going to be really anxious please be mindful not to and then a range of things that might be difficult for that human can you support them in this way is it okay if they sit a little bit off to the side um and they could yeah that kind of stuff so working with um uh, clinics and providers that are open to try and minimize the risks just with sometimes the littlest things, the littlest things that people could do if they know, if they just have that information and are prepared. So um, preparation is a huge component. I think it's not when having chats with parents as well, just because something should be easy doesn't mean it is. Like walk in, walk out, get a jab, too easy. Like um, it could be, but also maybe not and allowing for the maybe not and making space for the maybe not and having contingencies plan and if it is really really hard um 
it's okay for it to be really, really hard for that human. Other things will be easy. Uh, no shame and blame. It's like um, getting this thing is hard. We're going to do what we need to do to make it as okay and safe as possible. That will create less trauma in the long term and it'll make the next jab easier. Um, and it's, it's okay if it's hard. So my name is Dr. Sarah Bernard. I'm an autistic ADHDR disabled doctor working in Perth, Western Australia. This is a hugely important problem barriers to healthcare for neurodivergent people um, because they're stuck and there's plenty of research showing that ADHDers and autistic people um, and many neurodivergent people have worse health outcomes compared to the rest of the population. Um, and when it comes to COVID here, sadly in Australia, we don't have equity when it comes to protection from things like COVID booster vaccinations. Um, and like many things when we're talking about disadvantage, it's not just disabled and neurodivergent people, but it's across all kinds of intersections of disadvantage. So Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities, people with physical disabilities, people who access the NDIS have been shown to have lower booster update uh, up take as well as people with low incomes um, and people with lower education. Um, all of those disadvantaged groups have lower rates of getting their COVID boosters and it really makes me wild because those factors, you know, being Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander, being disabled or having a low income shouldn't mean that you don't deserve protection from COVID and when you see low vaccination rates in disadvantaged groups like that, we need to think about lack of access to services. So it's lack of transport, lack of access to good information about the benefits of vaccinations, fear of approaching doctors and medical places, maybe because of how those places have treated you or your family members or older generations in the past. It's concern about costs because people who don't have good information, might not actually know how to get their vaccinations for free. So I think health services and government programs can do better and think smarter about making vaccines accessible to everyone. Uh, they can think outside the box. They can leverage neurodivergent talent. Um, I would love to see more neurodivergent healthcare workers or training up neurodivergent vaccine coaches who go out into our community and engage people, find out what they're worried about, answer their questions and, you know, then help them make a vaccination appointment and give them a lift while they're at it to the appointment. And we've seen strategies like that work in some communities, some disadvantaged communities. So I think I would love to see more of it. Um, and if you're a neurodivergent person like me who has a lot of advantages, maybe we can make that our homework is to make it our homework to do that for someone in our community, um, in the disabled community or the neurodivergent community, be their coach, help them with organising their vaccine booster if that's what they want to do. And then when it comes to making healthcare spaces neurodiversity affirming, I think we need to talk first about the role of automatic bias. Um, and this goes to a, a really important research study that was about judgments, thin slice judgments. Those are the judgments that we make about a person unconsciously within seconds of seeing them. And in this study, non-autistic people watched 10 second videos and the people in the videos were a mix of autistic people and non-autistic people. And the people watching the videos didn't know whether the people they were watching were autistic or not. But the autistic people were all immediately judged more negatively than the non-autistic people. More awkward, less approachable, less deserving of friendship. And this is why autistic people de develop the ability to camouflage our autism. And that's an unconscious defence mechanism um, that involves hiding our autism, trying to alter our autistic ways of being to be more successful. 
Um, so it involves studying and copying other people's behaviour, rehearsing for different social situations, and all of that can be very successful, but it uses a lot of brain energy and is associated with poor mental health outcomes. So it would be great if there was less of a need for that. And it's also why autistic people are much more likely to delay seeking healthcare and same for ADHD people. But Autistic Doctors International did a really groundbreaking research study last year, um, which surveyed over 500 autistic people and 150 non-autistic people about visiting their GP in the UK. And they found that autistic people delayed visiting their GPs much more than non-autistic people. And when they looked at the reasons for delaying a GP visit, autistic people answered yes, much more than non-autistic people for reasons like sensory overload, not feeling understood, difficulty with phone calls, difficulty communicating with the doctor and difficulty communicating with reception staff. So sensory issues, organising appointments and being misunderstood are massive barriers to healthcare, but they're also really, really fixable. And there are so many ways that we can overcome that in healthcare. We can understand, first of all, that healthcare can be scary and traumatic for all neurodivergent people. So it makes sense for us to feel anxious. It doesn't mean we're overreacting. Um, healthcare can provide information, provide good information ahead of time because that increases predictability around a healthcare visit and that reduces anxiety. And it makes all of those things that are probably intuitive to neurotypical people clear to other people of different neurotypes. So things like a map uh, explaining how much parking there is, photographs of the staff, where the toilets are, what to expect at the visit and the order of events. It's very, very easy to put that on a website or into a brochure and make it available. Uh, healthcare can allow more ways to book and organise appointments and multiple formats for appointments. So offering face-to-face -face as well as telehealth is really, really important. Um, healthcare should ask about reasonable adjustments, I think, at the time of booking and follow through with providing those things and make it clear that healthcare settings welcome people to bring an advocate or a support person along to the appointment if they want to. I think when healthcare settings provide for sensory needs, like letting people wait in a different room, a quieter room, um, or wait outside or in their car, um, then that makes it a much more welcoming space. There are things that you can do to manage background noise, um, manage the acoustics in the building, even encouraging staff to avoid strong fragrances and perfumes, providing sensory fidgets. Um, if if healthcare workers communicate clearly because communicating outside of your neurotype is difficult to begin with. It's even harder when you're sick. So consider maybe reducing the small talk and allowing people to process what you're saying by pausing after one bit of information before you go on to the next bit of information. That is a very easy and inclusive thing to do. And finally, when it comes to instructions, write it down. Give instructions in written form or picture form or make a video with captions. The more formats that we can communicate our instructions in, the more those instructions will include every one of our patients. All neurokin deserve a GP they can trust. And even if you don't have one yet, you might be open to finding one. And when you find a GP you can trust, you should be able to talk to them about your health concerns. And then you can let them carry some of that mental load because they will be responsible and safe with your health. And what a good GP relationship is like is feeling heard, feeling validated, it's your GP telling you clearly and honestly what they think is going on, telling you what you can do about it and also what to do if things don't go according to plan. I think, first of all, we need to move. Um, so autism research is very much rooted in a medical model. So it's very deficit focused, impairments, dysfunctions. People even talk about disease like it's. And so I think we need to shift from that model because it's pathologizing and it does it's stigmatizing and does harm to the community um so that's I think that's a first step 
Um, and then the the second step is we need to think more about um, um, we need, almost need to move from a kind of an other defined, so similar to what I talked about before, like an other defined understanding of what, what people want for their own lives to a, 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 an individual an autistic defined model of what, you know, a good life means. Um, and um, the other issue is thinking about context. Um, and so, because mo because the medical model kind or the conventional med medical model often focuses on the individual. So it's the individual that needs to change rather than what's around them, whether that's the environment that they're in or the person that people that they're encountering. Mm -hmm.